You're listening to The Gulf Stream, the official podcast of the Heart Research Institute for Gulf of Mexico Studies at Texas A&M University, Corpus Christi. I kind of had this philosophy that instead of saying eat sustainably, eat consciously, I want you to go out and I want you to discover the stories behind your food. Go meet your farmer, see how it's raised, see how it's grown, what's happening in your community. Um, you know, I wanted to know that the deer that I was harvesting you know, how was the farmer farming? What cover crops was he using? How yeah. is that affecting the food that I'm eating? And really starting to kind of uncover the layers of of the natural world that from from where all of our food comes from. And I think the more that you start to really dive into that, the better decisions you're gonna be able to make for yourself. Let's dive in. Well, Danielle Pruitt. Hi. Welcome, welcome to the Gulf Stream. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm, by the way, I'm just like beyond floored and honored that you would invite me here to Aww. be on this podcast because um, it's, I just think what y'all are doing is really amazing and inspiring and I, I'm just really grateful to be here. Oh, well, that's awesome. That means a lot because we, we are so happy to have you here. Thank um, you. You, as soon as we started this podcast, I said, I want Danielle on this podcast. Really? And I kept pushing for it over and over and over again. Um, I'll go through, I'll go through the reasons why in a second, but before we get too far into it, I would love it if you can just, you know, give us a little brief intro just about who you are, what you do. Yeah. You know, it's really hard to describe what I do for a living because I'm still trying to wrap my head around how <laughs> how I get paid to do this. But I tell people that I have the coolest job in the world because I get to travel around hunting and fishing and finding interesting ways to source food and tell that story and and cook with that food, which is like a dream come true. And that's really all I ever want out of life is, sure. <laughs> is to be able to do that. Um, but um, But really... I'm a content creator for Meat Eater in the wild foods category. So I really specialize and dive deep into understanding um, and sharing better ways that people can take care of their harvest, um, whether it's a big game animal or a fish and teaching them how to get the most out of that. Awesome. Awesome. Well, yeah, that, that does sound kind of like a, like a dream job. And I know a lot of people around here, <laughs> around this building today were like, okay, yeah, I wish I could do that. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's cool. But, um, but yeah, no, I, I've wanted you to, to come be on our podcast because one, you're from Texas, so mm -hmm. you have that connection and, um, you're an angler. And so you obviously fit in around here at HRI and, and in Corpus in the Coastal Bend. Mm -hmm. um, you're involved with BHA Texas. So BHA is Backcountry Hunters and Anglers for yep. anyone who's not familiar. Um, you're a supporter of CCA. Um, we've had Pat Murray in here sitting where yeah. you're sitting. So, yeah. um, you know, he's a good friend. Um, but also you are somebody that I have looked up to personally for a long time. So I started, um, I, I've always been kind of an outdoors person, but I didn't start actually hunting until 2019 when I met my my partner now, um, and he he you know kind of introduced me to that world and mm -hmm. but I was still really looking for um, you know a female role model that's that's doing these activities and that's that's difficult to find when you're looking at an activity like hunting right mm -hmm. you know it's it's getting a little bit better but so I I found your your Instagram and and you know saw everything that you were doing and the adventures that you were having but it also really inspired me to get more involved um in the the cooking and you know being hands on mm -hmm. and you know seeing really my food from field to fork so Yeah. Well that's cool. I'm I'm uh humbled by that. That's a, <laughs> That's cool. You know, it's an emotional thing, but it's a beautiful thing too to to see your food from from oh, field. Oh, absolutely. To fork, so. It's um it's a life changing experience. I remember the first time I did that, I just realized like there was no way that I could go back. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, so that's that's a lot of what I want to talk about today is mm -hmm. is food, and you know we'll talk a lot about hunting and fishing and fishing again. It's not really a stretch for our show, but mm -hmm. um, hunting is a little bit different, and so I. I feel like in a way I need to do a little bit of a disclaimer to some of our viewers and listeners that may not be used to conversations about hunting. Um, you know, it can be a divisive topic to some people, but um, I think it's important to note like legal and ethical hunting, it plays a vital role in, in wildlife conservation. And mm -hmm. so we'll be talking about that and gardening and foraging and all of these other cool things that you do and how it can connect a person 
not only to their food, but, you know, to land and, you know, a more sustainable lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So um, I would just like to know, like, what is it that you love so much about, you know, hunting, fishing, all of this? You know, there's so many ways of looking at it. Um, the reason why I initially got into it, well, my husband introduced me to the outdoors. Um, actually, our first date, we he took me to a gun range to sight in a <laughs> rifle. And then our second date, he cooked me venison backstrap. Okay. And I re- which is kind of kind of a cute little thing. Um, but I remember he, when he came back, he was like, now this is really, really special meat here. This isn't like, mm-hmm. I just went to the grocery store, like this is special. Um, and he made a, a, a point to that. And I thought that was really interesting. And so as we started dating, um, like I loved cooking and I, I just started cooking a lot with that food. And, and it just kind of progressed and grew. And then um, I started, you know, my introduction into hunting was as a Texan dove hunting because that's just like a rite of passage Absolutely. practically. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's fun. It's like such an easy way to dip your toes into the water. Mm-hmm. Um, and and we had a bird dog, a golden that we trained. And so getting the dog involved, like th- there were just so many elements to the to the to the piece that all kind of came together. But the real thing that like really like I have I would say changed the trajectory of my life. Um, we moved to North Dakota for a stint for about five years. And the first year that we were there, we we did a lot of bird hunting. And I remember shooting my first pheasant. And this is a story I love to tell because um, it was so impactful for me. Um, it was just a kind of like a perfect moment. My golden shot it out of the, or flushed it out of the cattails right in front of me. I shot and... I had been cooking Travis's pheasants for about a, a year, and so I, I became very familiar with cooking pheasants. Um, but that day, I made a, a dish that I had made many times before, but I remember this special feeling of knowing that it was my bird that I had hunted and harvested, and it it was a... I felt an appreciation that I had never felt before with mm-hmm. anything that I I had ever made before. And I knew that it was the moment that this meal was not just a way to connect to my food, to understand the habitat from which it came. And, but it, it kind of gave my, it it gave meaning to the food. Like it was a way to create a life with meaning is Mm -hmm. what I I like to say. And that, like I was saying, it was like, there was no turning back. And I was like, I I should feel this way every time I eat. I should feel this gratitude for this animal every time I eat. And, and so that's kind of like what really set me on this path is wanting to understand those stories and those connections between the animals that I'm hunting and eating and, the natural world um, because I think so many people are interested in this idea of eating sustainably. Right. Which is kind of actually a term that I don't really love using only because I think it implies that there's like a right way and a wrong way. Sure. And it's yeah. our food system so incredibly complex that you can't really, it, there's no blanket answer for what is sustainable, but it allowed me to eat consciously. And I think that if you can show somebody who, I mean, maybe they don't even ever go hunting or anything, but if you can connect those dots about why this is so important and why um, these ecosystems and habitats are so necessary for the world that we live in, um, they will have a a better understanding and appreciation for that. Um, So that's really why I hunt. I mean, I think, I mean, there's a lot of reasons. There's Mm -hmm. just fascination and being able to eat something truly wild. Sure. Is, is, um, is up there for me. Yeah. Reasons why I hunt for sure. (laughs) But ultimately it is, it is that feeling that Mm -hmm. I, I'm always craving and chasing and, and um, it just gives, gives life more meaning. Yeah, I, t- I totally agree. I totally agree. And, and it's really, it's, it's hard to replicate that experience when you um, are able to, you know, 
share share food that you harvested um that you you know processed in your kitchen and share that with your family share that with your friends Mm -hmm. and yeah that's a great experience and then you get to tell the story about how it all happened and there's just there's not a lot of other ways that you can that Mm -hmm. you can get that and i think you know i i I didn't do a lot of dove hunting when I was a kid, but that was that was kind of my introduction to to the world yeah. of hunting as well. I remember vaguely like just being in a old cornfield with my dad and my stepbrother, and I was think I was being used as the dog. Like <laughs> yeah. a dove would fall, and I would run after it. Like I specifically remember uh-huh. that. Um, but so yeah, I didn't get back into it until I was an adult, and mm-hmm. um, my first. Um, my first hunt was a uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife mentored hunt. Mm -hmm. And I was very fortunate in that my partner got to guide me. And so it was a whitetail hunt. It was at Inks Lake State Park. And um, I will just, I will never forget that, that experience. I'll never forget any hunt that I've ever had, but I'll never forget that experience. And the, just the range of emotions, like, you know, I, I, yeah, it's a, you pull a trigger but at that moment like all of these emotions went through me like okay i'm 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 sad i'm excited i did it this is amazing Mm -hmm. but of course i'm like mourning this animal but i'm grateful for this animal yeah you know and so it's just it was very interesting but then i had a very you know unique experience too in that as i'm standing there like um processing this deer jesse griffiths was another um it was also a wild game chef he was uh he was another guide at this particular hunt so he's okay. there like showing me like certain certain cuts and so i don't think um an intro intro uh deer hunter is necessarily gonna want to yeah. take a tongue but i was like yes i want that <laughs> show me what show me how to do it show me how what i can make with it i want to uh-huh. know all of it so yeah um, very that's cool very interesting very interesting yeah having jesse griffiths there to help you process your <laughs> first year would be uh, I mean I golly um when I first started processing game I had no idea what to do and I relied on Travis my husband to sort of guide me and I remember like I I mean I had learned how to butcher an entire and process an animal before I ever even shot one so did he teach you that or did you like he taught me like kind of the like Pull it out of the cooler, take all the silver skin off. <laughs> mm-hmm. The back strap, tenderloins are tender. I don't really know about the rest. Oh, okay. Just get a big grind pile going. Gotcha. Kind of like, and gr- granted, like, you know, no one really taught him either. It was kind of like, it was all very, very trial and error. And this is sure. like pre-internet days of like, oh, I mean, well, there was internet. I'm not that old. <laughs> before you could before you could watch the like the step by step YouTube video yeah. by somebody. Yeah. yeah, like that that wasn't out there and so we, you know, th- I mean there were some books but at that point in my life I was not going to read a book. I, I just <laughs> wanted to figure it out on how sure. to do it. Um but but yeah, and and so there's been there's been a lot of trial and error, but through that I learned an incredible amount of um what not to do and what makes how to do things better Mm -hmm. um, and more efficiently Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to processing but um, that that alone has been pretty cool yeah it's a constant learning experience which Mm -hmm. I think is also also really cool about any outdoor activity Um, it really is yeah it's one of those things where you learn just enough to know that you know nothing right (laughs) right for sure for sure Um, and and it'll it'll spend I'll spend my lifetime just in curiosity and wonderment about about everything and and Mm -hmm. I think that's that's what's so cool about the outdoors is it's always changing we're always changing with with it um so and it's a really humbling place as well (laughs) so yeah definitely Yeah. yeah Well, I, I want to talk a little bit about um, Wild and Whole. I want to talk about Wild and Whole Sourced. And mm-hmm. so, um, you know, tell us a little bit about, about Wild and Whole um, and your show. Yeah, so I started Wild and Whole about six or seven years ago. And um, it was really just kind of a means for me to sort of document this, like, new life I had created. And, you know, after... Um, about a year living in North Dakota, I decided that 
I spent a lot of time like learning about our food system and I kind of didn't like the way that I was um, eating meat mm -hmm. or like w my mindless approach. Mm -hmm. And once I started hunting, it really clicked for me. And so I kind of made this this pact with myself and with Travis that I didn't want to buy any more meat from the grocery store. Everything we're going to cook at home from here on out, I want my hands to have some part in that and yeah. i want to have hunted it well he can hunt it uh but I, but like at least definitely processing it myself um and so that's what we started doing and then which was really ironic because that very first year we did it we didn't shoot a deer um and but we did have a very very successful waterfowl season okay and, i mean i love ducks i love <laughs> love eating birds but man like we almost ruined a good thing. We were eating ducks at least three nights a week. Wow. Wow. <laughs> after about eight months of that, you're like, oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Can, do, can we add Everyone some diversity to our diet yeah, somehow? Yeah. yeah. Um, so the first year that I implemented this was the hardest year ever because I was, I was like, how are we actually going to do this? And there were a couple times where I had to cheat and buy like lunch meat because I just mm. couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. But it only happened a few times that first year. I thought this was so cool. And, you know, obviously I was cooking a ton with it. And um, my friends urged me to start a blog. And I kept it really secret. I didn't tell anybody because I was embarrassed <laughs> by it. Um, but it really was just a way for me to sort of explore what it means to eat consciously and in just my own way of understanding this world that I was getting into and the stories behind where our food comes from. Mm -hmm. And so that's really all everything that it was about. And it, you know, over the years it's really evolved into just this, this brand where we can teach and inform others what that means to eat consciously how to connect your how to connect to your food whether that's not through hunting but finding a farmer or foraging or gardening and really just ultimately to be able to make better and more informed decisions about what we eat because mm -hmm. i think that's really some of the hardest things about what's sustainable sure. is most people are like, I don't know. I mean, this guy says don't eat meat. And this person says, yeah, like the whole, the whole thing is just kind of the media polarizes the extremes for sure. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so um, I've kind of had this philosophy that instead of saying eat sustainably, eat consciously, I want you to go out and I want you to discover the stories behind your food, go meet your farmer, see how it's raised, see how it's grown what's happening in your community. Um, you know, I wanted to know that the deer that I was harvesting, you know, how was the farmer farming? What cover crops was he using? How yeah. is that affecting the food that I'm eating? And really starting to kind of uncover the layers of of the natural world that from from where all of our food comes from. And I think the more that you start to really dive into that, the better decisions you're going to be able to make for yourself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and so that's what Wild and Hole started was, was being able to share that philosophy. And then we put together a show, which is basically that. Yeah. Um, telling the stories behind where our food comes from. That's awesome. And traveling around and getting to meet, you know, some very interesting people, I'm sure. And, and yeah. learning about, you know, various different food cultures and mm -hmm. traditions that people have, too. Yeah, I mean, from like speaking of cultures and traditions, going to Hawaii and getting to spend some time with Kimmy Werner and learning about their culture and their traditions was incredible. Um, but I mean, it's been I've I've done such such so much fun stuff that it's really hard. Every single episode was just an absolute blast. Yeah. Um, crabbing with Brad Leone in Connecticut was was killer. Um, I'd say from a foodie standpoint, the truffle episode was really, really cool. But Absolutely. <laughs> but um, I think what probably your audience would be uh, most excited about is um, dry aging fish. Um, an episode I filmed in California with someone named Leeway Li Li Leao. I probably pronounced his last name wrong. Leeway. Um, first dry aging commercial seafood market in hmm. the United States. Interesting. Um, 
and that that was really eye opening because I learned that there were better ways of taking care of my fish. Um, you know, what he did at a commercial level and why he did it was fascinating, but how we can translate that to every recreational angler, how, how you can, you know, preserve your harvest yeah. Um, yeah. was really fascinating. Well, I mean, talk a little bit about that. You know, I obviously, um, I'm sure a lot of people that that listen to listen to our podcast um, and, you know, know of HRI, they are anglers and, you know, we, we work with a lot of citizen science anglers, as you found out this morning. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, and they probably, um, and a lot of folks around here are just kind of set in their ways and, you know, they're going after, and that's fine, of course, um, but they're, you know, going after a certain species and, you know, this is the way that we've always done it. And this yeah. is the way that we, these are, this is the way that we've always filleted. And, you know, we might, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I saw an Instagram post of yours the other day, you had redfish throats and I think oh, yeah. that's something <laughs> probably not a lot of people would think of. So uh -huh. I would like to just, you know, talk about that dry aging process and how can um you know recreational anglers yeah you know... well for those listening and if you're like what is she talking about dry aging a fish um very similar to beef mm -hmm. you know you almost all beef that you buy today has been aged at some point now how long that's been aged is is different but the purpose of aging say like beef is that you're you're slightly dehydrating it so you're intensifying the flavor but you're also tenderizing it with fish you're doing something a little bit different and you're allowing that that fish just a few days to oh gosh what's the right word to sort of firm up the texture the actual texture of the fish meat itself mm -hmm. improves um, and then you are getting an enhanced quality flavor of the fish itself which doesn't like there's a difference between more fish flavor doesn't mean it's fishy right it means it tastes more like the fish mm -hmm. um, which i think is hard for people to differentiate sure um, and then another benefit of dry aging fish is if if the skin is on, which this when you dry age, the skin should be on, scaled, scaled, gutted, um, the skin on. Um, it allows it to breathe just a little bit, but the outside of the skin dries. So when you cook a fish fillet with the skin on, it gets really beautifully crispy. That just unbelievable. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, and then perhaps, especially at a commercial level, I think one of the greatest benefits that I learned was that this allows um, – commercial fishermen to extend the shelf life of their fish because you know how, how many times do we go somewhere and we're like i want that fish caught this day right you know like right. fresh is best and so he's really challenging that notion and that you know aging it is is increasing the shelf life and there's a lot less waste in mm -hmm. the seafood commercial industry um but as for you know the average at home angler my biggest takeaways which um maybe some people do or don't do um you gotta bleed your fish out okay you that's an extra it. step that most people don't take it just goes straight to you the gotta and do that's it. it and yeah. the way that i like to do it and especially with redfish because their gills are are hard as as they're yeah. they're tough to cut yeah um a pair of wire cutters we always keep a pair of wire cutters on the boat and the easiest way to to bleed out a fish are to cut the gills and um you know put them on a stringer leave them in the water mm -hmm. and and let them totally bleed out it sounds really cruel <laughs> saying that out loud but it it you'll see a dramatic difference in the quality of the meat and wow. the color of the meat um there's flavor in that blood so when you're when you're cleaning that out you're 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 getting a cleaner fresher tasting fish mm -hmm. um I would absolutely, without a doubt, I never not bleed a fish. Okay. I would always recommend that to everybody. Um, and that's the simplest thing you can do to just get a better piece of fish. Mm -hmm. um, if you wanted to dry age it, you would want to scale the fish. I mostly target redfish, and so I never scale the fish. Gonna be my <laughs> that was going to be my next question. Like, no. what do you like to fish for most? But Yeah, yeah. Re redfish is... Redfish is my favorite to fish, and it's my favorite to eat. Okay. Um, above smuckled trout and flounder, which yeah, I know some I people to... will disagree with that, but I just personally like the texture of redfish better. It's, mm -hmm. um, I just like it better. Um, 
so I don't I don't do that. But if you know this kind of technique would be great if you're a snapper, if you fish for snapper, like this would be an I dry aging would be ideal for that. Um, but you would basically gut it, scale it, pat it really dry, and then leave it in your refrigerator for a couple of days, and that's it. Okay, it's as, it's as easy as that. Which sounds like oh my gosh, that's gonna be gross. So like we, we I caught a fish and early in the morning. We didn't get back to dock till late that night, and we kept it on ice, and then and literally kept it on ice overnight. The next day, we cleaned it, scaled it, patted it really dry, and kept it dry, wrapped it in brown paper, and then the day after that, I flew home with it on an airplane, hmm. and then I hung it in my fridge for two more days, and then I... I filleted it and ate it. Interesting. So if I were mean, were you a little nervous about that? Like, okay, no, fl- okay. It smelled. It smelled <laughs> fine. Good. Yeah. No, I mean, if yeah. you if it smells bad, there's something. There's wrong. something wrong. But, but if not. Um, it it smelled fine, and it, and it was so so good, and um, it really changed my perspective. Um, another tip that I would say that I do now, that I know about this, even though I don't dry age redfish the traditional way that you would. I always keep it really dry. So I've always thought that you're supposed to like rinse fish with water, right? right. Like mm-hmm. everybody does that. Mm-hmm. And I used to always do that. And water can be the enemy for meat, um, especially like... Especially fish. Yeah. Especially fish. It's a great Get real mushy. breeding ground for bacteria mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and and can cause more fishy smells from that. Um, so when we fillet a fish... I don't rinse it off because it's already been bled out. Mm-hmm. It looks really clean. Mm-hmm. I take uh, like a paper towel and I just like if there's like a, any a scale or something on it, I just pat it really dry, clean it. And then um, because there's no skin on it, it dries out easy in the refrigerator. So then I'll cover it in the refrigerator and then I'll leave it there for a couple a couple days or until I'm ready to eat. Um but yeah, that's my process. That's really cool. And I think I, I'm definitely going to try it. We're, we've been really wanting to get out and, and go after some mangrove snapper, um, just, you know, in kind of inshore yeah. in, in canals and stuff. So mm-hmm. um, the next time that we do that. It'd be perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So Li Wei did a Japanese technique where he would take a, an extremely sharp knife and actually cut the scales off. Um but you definitely don't have to do that. Your regular old-fashioned fish scaler is is fine. Okay. All right. Cool. Yeah. Very yeah, cool. Yeah, give it a try and let me know what you think. Okay. I mean, if anything, there's so many times where you go out fishing and you're on the water all day and you're tired and you come back and, mm-hmm. and you know, you've got this burden of, of taking care of, of it. Not have... You know, like simplifying that process of saying, okay, I'm just going to gut it. And yeah. you can wash out, you know, that cavity portion um, and scale it and pat it dry and leave it in the fridge. It's like, just to me alone, some of those little things like make your life easier. For sure. For and so sure. you can wake up a day later, two days later, later when you have time to really focus on preparing that fish in a, in a in the way that you want you're mm-hmm. not like exhausted <laughs> well and you're doing that fish justice too um, yeah by putting a little extra time and yeah and care into preparing it so mm-hmm. um i want to i w- definitely want to talk about um you know some other aspects of the show like foraging and and stuff like gardening as well mm-hmm. um but before we do before we leave this topic um i think it's really cool um some of the things that Yes, you do on the show, but also um, just, you know, on your Instagram, you have a lot of uh, videos um, about just making use of various different cuts and, mm-hmm. and making use of different animal species, things that people typically would shun or throw away, mm-hmm. um, like even even something down to like a shank or a skirt oh, yeah. steak or um, fat, you know, that's most often stuff that people throw away that they don't want so yeah. i would just like to hear from you like talk about um you know if somebody thinks an animal or I, I, like wild turkey is a really good one like my, my family for some reason um when i started hunting turkeys they were like oh i don't like it it's just it's it's a weird I, flavor and i'm like so... <laughs> how why it's the best are you kidding me but and yeah. so and i don't is it just because people have had it like they had some you know some serve to them a so long time much ago is, it's a learned behavior yeah, yeah i think so much of that like I, i've heard that about turkeys i've only heard that from people 
in South Texas area. But um, when you think about hogs, mm-hmm. when you think about snow geese in particular, which is one that really, really grinds my gears. Okay. Um, I think it's a learned behavior. And I think a lot of it, you know, is just sort of the the myths and the stories we tell that we pass on and and we just kind of believe it to be true Mm -hmm. and without experimenting for ourselves right and i think that's really unfortunate that we're not able to kind of find out and figure out you know is this actually good or is it bad and i think for me what is really important especially if you're gonna hunt for anybody you know food waste is an issue Mm -hmm that's like rampant. We waste anywhere from 35 to 40% of food in America alone. And most of that happens within the home. And for hunters and anglers, I think that it is our responsibility to, I mean, not only honor the life of the animal Mm -hmm. that died for your meal, but the fact that we are taking something out of our resources for ourselves, um, we deserve to be using it mm-hmm. and not letting it go to waste. And, and I, I mean, I'm, I don't utilize every single tiny piece of everything, sure, but I, tough. I use a lot, mm-hmm. a lot. When we go fishing, I, I save every fish head. I, I take the, you know, the meat, the fillets, the throats, uh, the head and the, the carcass all get made into fish stock, either, awesome. either for a seafood blue base, um, some sort of seafood stew in the winter time, which is like three weeks out of the year. Um, but after that I give it I make it every every time for my dogs who love it and I Oh perfect. I, I attribute her um her um her health to to getting fish stock regularly. Um but I don't like letting things go to waste. Yeah. And um I think that's an issue. But as far as like the stories we tell about why something's not good, you know, like I think I think there's an issue when it comes to an animal in numbers, Mm -hmm. when something becomes labeled as invasive, when something becomes labeled as uh, overpopulated, abundant, Mm -hmm. like a snow goose that are, you know, we, we do these things, have our spring conservation season in the name of conservation. And yet for some reason, just because there's so many, we just decide to label them as they may not be good. Sure. Yeah. And it's just, it's why, why do we have that perspective? Um, I, I don't understand. And um, part of it, I uh, frankly, I think it's just being lazy. And I'll, <laughs> I'll be honest. I know. I, I'll be, I I'll be honest. I, I, yeah. I do think that, you know, you shot 60 geese. Oh, crap. Am yeah. I really going to clean 60 geese? Yeah. you damn right. You should. <laughs> you <laughs> you should. took the time. You put forth the effort. You um, should. Yeah. But yeah. But yeah, so I mean the the stories we tell about game and their flavor, I think a lot of that is learned behavior and yes, I do think some of it comes from poorly processing it mm-hmm. or or um not cooking it right. Sure, sure. I think that's another reason that that you know, in in my house we have we've never and not to in any way put down anyone who, um, you know, might take their big game to a processor, you know, mm-hmm. do whatever works for you, obviously. But that's something that we have, we do take very seriously is like, yes, we want to see our food from field to fork, but we also want to have that hands on experience of, you know, um, having that roast, taking out that roast and, 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 you know, packaging it in such a way that one, you know, it looks nice if we gift it to family, but also, you know, that we have put extra care and extra hours into it so Mm -hmm. that, um, you know, we know that, that that's going to taste good. And we know that we have, you know, some recipe in mind for it or, you know, something like that. Yeah. Um, but again, it, it goes back to, we've, we've gone out, we've taken yeah. that time to do it. So we feel like that that's just, I think, you know, it kind of harkens back to what I was saying about earlier about like, you find this real value in food and, and, you know, I'm not a psychologist, but, um, have you ever heard of ju- effort justification and this, the Ikea effect where yeah. they, they took, they took a, a group, a study, two groups of people. One group got a bunch of Ikea furniture, rated, you know, one to 10. And they're like, eh, anywhere from three to six, like, you know. And then the other group, they got the Ikea furniture 
but they had to build it themselves. Mm -hmm. So like the first group got it already built. The second group that built it themselves, after they built it, even if it might have been a little janky, yeah. <laughs> they rated it significantly higher. Wow. And that's because there's a direct correlation between the effort we put into something, mm -hmm. we perceive that more valuable. Absolutely. And I've learned it time and time again in hunting. The harder... I work, the more miles I put on my feet for that sharp tail grouse, the moment yeah. I sit down to eat and I'm like, gosh, this is so good. So the more you value it, the less likely, likely you are to waste something. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a valuable les lessons for, for everybody, but even hunters and anglers that, you know, you want to get the most out of what you're doing. And when you take the time to say, process it yourself, even if you're not a professional butcher. Not by any a stretch of the imagination. You're going to find so much more satisfaction yeah. in that meal because you did that. And I, I think that's worth something. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, not to put you on the spot at all, but um, so a, a f speaking of something that tends to get a bad rap, I think, um, mm -hmm. king mackerel. Um, we, I, I was, was telling you off camera, you know, we have a kayak that we typically take offshore. Mm -hmm. And whenever we do that, um, we're only offshore maybe a couple of miles, but um, we're typically targeting king, king mackerel. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's a species that a lot of people say is, you know, it's really oily, which it is. It is very oily. Um, people say that it's too fishy. You can't do a lot with it other than fry it, um, which it's good fry too. Fried fish is great. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, we, we, I want to find more recipes and more ways to use that because yes, they, they're, they're large fish and we make the tailgate ceviche and that's, that's really fun. But I've had in mind to, um, well, backstory, good friend of mine, her mother is from Korea mm -hmm. and she told me that mackerel was something that, you know, her, her mom really likes that is eaten a lot in Korea. Mm -hmm. And so I had this idea, like, would some kind of like, fish head soup or something like that would would king mackerel be a good fish for that traditionally with anything that you make like a seafood stock or a seafood stew they always say avoid oily fish okay i mean i've had a lot of things with salmon that i think are fantastic mm. in that vein um so I would have to try it to say whether or not that would be good. I'm not going to say that it's not going to be good. I think everything's worth trying for sure. Um, I, I don't have a lot of experience with mackerel. It's not something that we, we generally fish for. And granted, everything that I cook is something that we hunt or fish. So if mm -hmm. I don't fish for it, I don't have a lot of sure. cooking experience with it. But one thing that um, when we were in California, leeway had a bunch of smoked mackerel and he was he was talking about the same thing about how people frown upon mackerel all the time and a lot of it's cultural mm -hmm. um definitely cultural um but he had smoked mackerel and it was amazing it was awesome yeah put it with okay. like some like cream cheese or something on a cracker and oh, it, was, yeah. it was amazing yeah yeah it sounds pretty sounds great but we'll we'll figure it out <laughs> it'll be an experiment but you know we we like to do that and yeah you know we've had plenty of failures and you know tried plenty of cro crock pot recipes that have just not been what we hoped for <laughs> but you know we thought we were going to be like this great broth but just turned out like real like real fatty and not flavorful but anyway we'll We'll experiment so yeah um so i know also um you have a great episode um of wild and whole sourced where you are visiting with um, a rancher in in georgia mm. and they have they do a lot of regenerative farming practices mm -hmm. which i think is is super interesting um are do you know are a lot of um ranchers kind of getting into that area I think so yeah you know i think one of the challenges with regenerative is it's not scalable. Mm -hmm. You know, we've created with agriculture, you have an experience in agriculture. So as you know, sort of the history of the way we farmed is that, you know, this centralized way of doing things and increasing and scaling up has, has been kind of what drove drove uh the market and how we kind of got into the problem where we're at with factory farming mm -hmm. and that's one of the harder things with regenerative is you can't take this you know abc formula and stick it everywhere so white oak pastures in georgia um the farm that in the episode she's talking about is for people listening 
a, a regenerative farm that has pretty much a closed loop system where they raise all the animals raised on their pasture, whatever is not used for meat or human consumption. Um, you know, they're, they're either tanning the hides and those bones, what they can't sell bones for stock and visceral waste gets composted. And That's have huge uh, compost things. And yeah. then that compost gets aged like a couple of years. So you can imagine there's quite a few layers to their mm -hmm. compost system. Turns into beautiful they, soil. They, yeah, they they then churn it out and and spray it back out onto the ground. Um, so it's a really cool cool thing that they're doing, and they've got the Savory Institute coming out where they take soil samples and they can see how much carbon they're actually sequestering. Wow, granite. They get 43 inches of rain a year. Yeah. You know, and it's fascinating that I'm like, how can you can't cut and paste that everywhere? Sure. Um, because a big part of the way they do that is that rotational grazing, um, that high animal impact and then taking that animal off to to regrow over and over again. Um you know, what that pattern looks like is different in other places, but that's not to say that you can't do that in other places. You know, I'm, I'm fascinated with, um, we just moved to South Texas, um, outside of San Antonio and my husband works, um, in oil and gas out in the field and some of the landowners he was talking to, a lot of them are regenerative farmers. Interesting. It's little small scale. And yeah. he, you know, his family has a ranch and so we ask a lot of questions every time we need a regenerative farmer. We ask like a thousand questions, and you know some of the more popular ones are like, um, you know, are you actually making money doing this? Yeah. Because it costs a lot to the consumer. I'm sure. Um, and the answer is yes, they are. And in fact, um, the guy, you know, the farmers that we've talked to have a wait list to get on to buy a cow. Wow. And so he's got his, you know, like almost like a. Um, a CSA basket in yeah, a way yeah. where he, you know, he knows that his, that his year is provided for. Um, and I, I just thought that was just curious because the South Texas environment is nothing. You would never like, expect that. Yeah. Like what um, that, that area, area in, Georgia. in Georgia is like, especially, you know, a fraction of the rainfall. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think that's really promising. And I think it's what's for me, as somebody who's in, in the outdoors, what's promising about that is that what you're we're doing to sort of regenerate this is so beneficial to the biodiversity and the wildlife that we desperately need. And um, there's been some like really cool studies on how it's benefiting the the prairie chicken in, of Texas. Right. The Adwa. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just think like those kind of interconnections to me are, are really fascinating that I, I love to hear about is, is how can we utilize agriculture and farming, which we, we need. Sure. How can we do that and improve our wildlife and the ecosystems that, that we have, um, and so I'm I'm constantly kind of looking at those stories. I got yeah. I got off on a tangent. <laughs> oh no no that's okay. But I was just gonna say that's actually a perfect a perfect transition because you know from from agriculture that is benefiting you know our overall ecosystem. Um, I think that's a really cool thing that oyster aquaculture is now yeah, doing. Yeah yeah yeah. Um, and we you know had the opportunity to sit with uh, Brad Lomax last night, and he's he's telling these stories about how um you know crabbers just love being around his farm mm -hmm. because yes he's growing these farm grown the first farm grown yeah. oysters in texas but it has spawned you know so much other life around there yeah and i think that's that's a really interesting thing and i mean obviously we we know that you know oyster reefs are are vital to um to a healthy ecosystem as it yeah. is but it's really neat to see that an oyster farm can have some of those same same benefits. Yeah. So hopefully, hopefully more more and more of that will you know become part of the Texas landscape. Yeah, um, and I think that really starts with consumer education. Mm -hmm. You know, when everything was going on last year with the with the proposal to close the the Mesquite Bay complex. Um, I, I became really aware that most people had no idea that this was even happening, no idea that this was going on. Um, called so many places around the coast, like, what kind of oysters do you sell? Look, Gulf, Gulf, 
Like, what yeah. else would we sell? Yeah. Like, do you have any farmed? And um, they're, you know, definitely not. Some of them scoffed at me, um, which I understand because I'm I'm a native Texans too, and I'm prideful of our of state and our resources. Yeah, I, I want Texas stuff, um, <laughs> but but it just became aware that most people have no idea and even though like you know people want to make sustainable decisions but you know they just don't know sure and so i think that was like a really cool story to to get to experience and and see how all that sort of came about and meeting brad and um getting to try his oysters and just being able to tell that story to sort of connect the dots of like, this is why you should care about where your oysters come from mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and how it impacts and affects our ecosystems and our base system. Absolutely. Um, it, you know, we're something that we're working on here at HRI, you know, it's still a little bit down the road. Um, we're going to have the oyster resource and recovery center. We mm -hmm. joke around here. It's the orc. Um, it sounds, you know, it's a much more silly, silly name, but um, ultimately what we hope to do, and we're working with various different groups throughout the Texas A&M Corpus Christi campus um, to, we're hoping to teach people that are interested in oyster aquaculture, um, giving them an avenue to learn how to do that mm -hmm. um, from the actual farming practices to that, you know, backbreaking labor that Brad was talking about that he had been doing all day, um, but still was gracious enough to come to dinner. Mm -hmm. um, but from that to, you know, figuring out a business plan and stuff like that, because mm -hmm. I think it's, it's, I can imagine that it's something that a lot of people would be very interested in. They just oh, don't know yeah. how on earth to get started oh, yeah. with something like that. Yeah, I so. totally agree. I think that would be really valuable for for a lot of people. I, I think that's it's kind of a new frontier mm -hmm. for us here. And I think it's exciting to watch grow, but that's definitely a resource that's much needed. Yeah, for sure. For sure. It's It's got an, a lot of opportunity and a lot of growth opportunity. So mm -hmm. we'll see how it goes. But yeah. Um, before before we leave before we leave this topic, I want to get into BHA and, and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. um, foraging um, is something no. that I think is, <laughs> is super interesting. Um, how did you get into foraging? Oh, just you know, he spent enough time outside looking for food. <laughs> what, is what is this? What is this? What is this? He spent enough time outside. Yeah. Um, you, I'm. I also have just a very curious mind in general. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm not. A, I'm not a. I'm not in the weeds, so okay. to speak. Okay. Um, there's a handful of things that I really enjoy. I mean, there I, I've learned to pick up on the native plants growing in the backyard um, that I could just uh, pluck and eat. Mm -hmm. um, but and then there's some more fun things that everybody loves, like dewberries. I was about to say dewberries. If you're dewberries. from Texas, you've got to know about Lo dewberries. Love dewberries, and it's yeah. just something really fun. This past Easter, um, we took my nieces and nephews out and went, found the dewberry patch, Aww. and I, I, I just love that. Um, and the thing that I think is sort of the most exciting and most delicious wild food out of the state of Texas are chanterelles. Okay. Which... Most people don't even know we have them because they just think of them as a Pacific Northwest kind of a thing. Um, and actually, we do have a lot of chanterelles. They don't look exactly the same as some of the iconic ones. Mm -hmm. um, we get these vibrant orangey red uh, called cinnabars that are just these little petite button chanterelles that I, I really love. Um, but... Um, that, that that has been probably one of my favorite things to do because they pop up here um, after a good rain in the early summer before it gets to be too crazy like it is now. Okay. Um, so anywhere from like the end of the May, May and June is like really prime prime opportunities. And if anybody's interested in foraging, I'll I'll give the disclaimer that like you should absolutely with one hundred percent certainty know what you're picking. Yes. Um grab a couple books. There's a mycological book of the uh what's it called? Mushrooms of the Gulf State Gulf Coast mm. or something like that. Um Gulf States, I think. Okay. Meant to... Anyway, um 
there's a few different great foraging books that are um, dedicated to this area, and you should definitely seek out those resources to know what you're picking. So if I want to find a morel in Texas, is that possible? <laughs> they are, yes, they are here. Um, I have yet to find one on public land. Okay. So that um, one other thing that's important if you do want to forage, technically it's illegal to forage on state land, but you can forage on federal. So um, our national forest, and if you do want to find chanterelles, uh, East Texas National Forest, they're pretty abundant. And then in generally speaking, there's, there's a handful of morels um, in that upper northeast part of the state. Um, and then some in the hill country area, I very ironically, um, I've looked in a couple places on public land. There's not a lot of uh, federal federal um, places up in that area for morels. And so I have not been successful finding them, but I know that we do have them. But the window for getting them is extremely short, sure. like February and they're gone. They're gone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, good to know. I, it's always something that I've had in the back of my mind of like, I would really like to just go out and, and look for morels. Look for, but now that I know that chanterelles are, um, they're a more lot more readily accessible. available than, yeah, they're, I, they're a lot more accessible for sure. Okay. And you can get lots of them. Get lots of them. <laughs> All right. Noted. Um, well, I, it's also a great transition. You mentioned public land. Yeah. And so um, I would love to hear, you are um, a board member at large, is that right, for BHA mm -hmm. Texas? And so tell our, our listeners and viewers a little bit about what BHA does. Yeah. So BHA is the voice for outdoorsmen and women who not only uh, value our resources, but utilize public lands and water to recreate. And so we're we're sort of the the voice for that and to ensuring that public has access to those places and obviously protecting them um, from from losing those places. Um, so I think it's an, an incredibly important organization, um, especially for for so many people who don't have a hunting lease or you know a ranch or or any of those those outlets hunting can be really expensive um i think it's incredibly important that we have these places that people can go to and access that is that is our right mm -hmm. um constitutional right to have and you know like i said before i think getting people involved in the outdoors is such a key to fostering that relationship with nature and in raising future generations of conservationists. So having these public spaces, I think is incredibly important. Absolutely. And I think that that's something that a lot of people, um, whether they're coming to Texas, whether they've lived in Texas their whole lives, you know, they're surprised to learn that Texas does have public land. Yeah. Um, we have, I want to say, over a million acres, whether that's, you know, state parks to, mm -hmm. um, you know, state natural areas, but also we have public hunting lands. Yeah. Um, you just have to get the little booklet and yeah. know how to find them. Yeah, you definitely have to do some homework. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that can be put off a lot of people, but there's also, as we continue to grow in population, this growing pressure um, that's that's necessary to to kind of do your due diligence as a hunter. Um, but I think our public water, yeah, I mean our coast, exactly. I mean, to me, that's just sort of the most accessible way for people to get outside, and it's definitely something that since moving from North Dakota, where we just had like vast amount of land mm -hmm. to come in here um we really sort of shifted and adapted to what texas has to offer and have really embraced um just how cool our coast is and, and everything that we can do here yeah for sure um, um i something that's said around here a lot is that I, and greg stuns he he says it pretty often is that texas you know is often thought of as just a state with a coast mm -hmm. as opposed to being a coastal state which we are, we're, we're a coastal state. And so it's, it's um, really important that people recognize, you know, how, what mm -hmm. a treasure that really is. Yeah. And, you know, I don't want people to think that when we're talking about public lands and even when BHA is talking about public lands, we're not just describing those lands as a, you know, something that you can use um, for whatever consumptive means. You don't just have to use them for hunting and, and fishing. Yeah. They are your lands to yeah. go and be outside and enjoy yeah so yeah if you want to bird watch 
whatever whatever hike you yeah. know their forage yeah um yeah, and so it, it's been great to be a part of BHA. And honestly, as a, as a board member at large, I'm just kind of there to sort of fill in the gaps and help where I can. And really the heavy lifting is the rest of our board members have are just have been amazing and they're incredibly hardworking and incredibly passionate. And it's been really cool to see um, what is relatively a new chapter here really grow and, and thrive. And this past year we received the for national bha we received chapter of the year award which is oh, really cool. which is really cool um this past year we raised uh money and put gave eight thousand dollars to tpwd scholarship funds we just recently um did a project for pronghorn habitat up in the panhandle called That's the rita right. blanca um so we're always kind of doing various conservation projects like when CCA had a cord grass planting. Mm -hmm. You know, we we love to get involved with other conservation organizations. Um, we were really active and vocal about educating public um, on conservation issues like the oyster, um, Fairfield State Park, right. um, some of those issues. So we've we've been very vocal and very active. And I think one of the great benefits of BHA is that it really helps create a community mm -hmm. especially since there's a lot of adults coming to hunting for the first time ever um people will always ask like well how do i start how do i get into it exactly. it's just there there's a lot of information that you need to know and bha is a really great resource to get plugged into a community and find a mentor and to get some guidance on where to go how do we how do we utilize our public system mm -hmm. um how do we read that that booklet um, yeah exactly <laughs> W Mays and and because there's a lot to know, um, so so that's um one thing that I'm really proud to to be able to represent BHA and and for what they stand for. That's great. Um, yeah. I I've been a BHA member since I started hunting because I just I really believe in in everything that BHA does and mm -hmm. and especially like you said that community aspect. Um, and I think that it's it's really important for for new hunters new anglers um just new outdoors people to have that because it can be a very intimidating thing especially for women you know yeah whether you're um you're interested in getting into archery or um i remember the first time i walked into an archery shop and uh, like it was the one day that emmanuel my partner couldn't go with me and he was like okay they need to like you know like size it for you and stuff and i was like i don't i have no idea what to ask i don't know what to do that yeah. stuff can be very overwhelming it is and so it's really it's it's really cool to have um, yeah that community that is there to help and isn't going to judge you and you know yeah. um is excited to help so how can how can people get involved with bha if they want to learn more um there's various chapters throughout our state and um What's cool is uh, every month in certain cities, I think like Dallas and Houston, Austin, um, have pint nights so you can go grab a beer and, and just kind of hang out with, with people. And um, one of our biggest events of the year is coming up in September kind of coming up. Um, it'll be here soon. <laughs> it'll, it'll be here soon. Yeah. It's called uh, Conversations on Conservation. I always have a hard time saying that. <laughs> basically the same word yeah. <laughs> yes um and really you know that's that's a fun event where you know there's food drinks raffles prizes and all that and then there's a, a panel discussion that we talk about key issues in within texas on conservation so last year pat murray was there alvin dudo ben masters jesse awesome. griffith so mm -hmm. it was it was just like a really cool and insightful to hear them kind of speak on on behalf of what's going on within the state and so this next year um i think cca is going to be one of our partners um and some other organizations too so awesome. we're looking forward to that very cool and i know i've seen that they have you know every now and then like a public lands cleanup event or something yeah, where people yeah, can go every get their year, hands dirty yeah there's there's a lot of public land cleanup um there's a there's a big one annually um i want to say it's in april or may which is 
always really hot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but we do we do other other cleanup like river cleanup too. Mm-hmm. So we've covered we've covered a lot. Yeah, we have. <laughs> well, so where where can people go to to watch Wild and Whole sourced, and where can people find you know just some of your recipes mm-hmm. and some of your you know even like gear recommendations? I think that stuff is super interesting. So. Yeah, um, most of what I do, you know, I'm all over social media. That's just the that's the nature of the, the world right now. Beast. Yeah, um, just uh, it's a it's still hard for me to wrap my head around it. But me it too, is, and I do it professionally. Effect- <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's an effective means to communicate with people. Um, so I'm on Instagram, Danielle Pruitt, um, and there's also a Wild and Whole page. Um, and then a lot of the recipes that if you're looking for like really specific how to articles, like real nitty gritty, like how much that do I add to my wild grain? Mm-hmm. Should I soak my meat in milk? Like those kinds of like heavy hitter questions. I write a lot of articles and have recipes on the meat eater website. Um, so you can find a lot there. Perfect. Awesome. Well, hopefully, hopefully people will, after they see this, they'll be inspired to go try out a new recipe. Yeah, or... I hope so. Yeah. I hope so. That'd be nice. Yeah. Well, hopefully leave us some comments. If you guys go and, and cook something, like let us know about it. I want to hear about it. <laughs> um, well, I hope, Danielle, that you can come back. I know that you've had some, you know, conversations with some of our researchers today, mm-hmm. um, you know, whether it's getting out with our Coastal Conservation Restoration Group or going out with, with Dr. Kesley Banks and, you know, doing some work with Makos. I know. I think um, that sounds <laughs> wild. That sounds that sounds really fun. <laughs> I, I really hope that we can get you back. Maybe, um, you know, if, if BHA perhaps in the future can get involved with the uh, oyster bagging event or something. That yeah, would be really yeah, cool. yeah. I so, think so. Don't be a stranger to I HRI. Won't. I won't. This has been such a fun trip. And again, I'm so honored to be here. Awesome. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate yeah. it. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, consider contributing to a greater gulf by visiting heartresearch.org. That's H-A-R-T-E research.org.